Hey everyone, welcome to this system design and mock interview. Today I'm really pleased to say that we have Alex with us, who was an engineering manager at Shopify for 10 years. Alex, thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely. My name is Alex Massad. I'm a senior developer and engineering manager, and I worked at Shopify for over 10 years. Um, while there, I've peeked behind the curtain of the hiring process, and I've mentored many individuals with this uh, exercise. Um, well, we're really pleased to have you on, and um, without further ado, let's, uh, let's crack on. Sounds good. So what are we designing today? Today, Alex, I wanted to ask you to design a system like Dropbox, iCloud, or Google Drive. Okay. That makes sense. I've used a lot of these apps. I think I was an early uh, Dropbox uh, sign up uh, in their early days. Um, so as I understand this app, it's generally a file syncing app. So, I mean, the, the apps do a lot of things and integrate with a lot of other systems, but uh, to keep this within uh, you know, a 45 minute uh, discussion, would it be fair to say that the main features that we're looking at are um, downloading and uploading files and then syncing it between uh, devices? Yes, that's correct. Um, but it also needs to have a way to notify clients that updates have occurred so that they can receive the changes. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Let me just write these requirements down so that I don't forget them. So uploading, downloading, sync, and then uh, notifications. Okay. Um, and so within these files, like specifically the, the, the files that are being uploaded, is there any restriction on the type of files that you can upload? No, all, all file types are supported. Um, the system is blind to the specific file contents. So for example, videos and photos won't be previewed in the app to keep this design simple. Okay, that makes it a lot more, uh, more simple. So uh, let's just say any file type. So we don't have to preview videos or anything like that. Is this gonna be a desktop app or are there any other uh, clients? Yes, um, it will be a mobile app, a web app and a desktop desktop app. Um, let's say that the company wants this app to be the easiest and most trusted platform to sync your files. Okay, that is a good uh, ethos to run with. I think that helps kind of guide a lot of the, the decisions as well. Um, so sure. some, some nuts and bolts here. How many users does the uh, product have? Yeah, uh, let's say 100 million users signed up um, with a 1 million daily active users. One million, okay. That's not too bad. Uh, so how many files get uploaded each day per user? Yeah, I think we can assume that each user uploads one file a day on average. Uh, some may be, may be zero, but some, some will be zero. So um, yeah, let's average it out to one a day. Okay, what's the average uh, file size? Let's assume um, each file is about five megabytes average. That makes sense. Um... Ah, is there a file limit per user? Yeah, let's say each file must be uh, 10 gig or, or smaller. And then there's a 15 gig limit per user account. Okay. Okay. So let me just look through here. So general features, the functional requirements that we're going to work on for this app are uploading. Uh, so that's going to be uh, when you create or you upload content, uh, that's going to trigger that uploading action of our app. Uh, downloading files, which you know, makes sense to a lot of us, but just to state the obvious, when other clients will do this when they when a create or an update has happened. So you upload something on your phone, your desktop will go and download that file. Um, so that'll create the feature that does a sync across devices, sort of the magic that uh, pulls it all together, and then notifications. So that's going to happen uh, when I upload a file on one device, it's going to sort of send that notification to make sure that everything is in sync. Um, so that sort of makes sense for the, the sort of functional requirements. I think outside of the scope, we've got a few um, maybe sort of commonly thought of use cases for these apps. So the number one I think of is previewing of files. Um, oftentimes, if it's a video, there'll be a play button so you can watch it. Or if it's a photo, there'll be a thumbnail so you can sort of see what uh, 
picture.jpg actually is. We're not going to cover that to kind of keep this within uh, scope. Also, I guess, uh, editing of content. So in Google Drive, if you put in a Google Doc, you can actually edit that doc. Uh, that sort of functionality that they've added, we're not going to cover that. Um, and then sharing of files as well. I think that's sort of outside of scope. I assume that sharing of files will be very similar to the downloading flow. So just to keep this discussion fast, we're not going to design it today, but we just understand that a file could be shared outside to a, a non-logged in user. Just we're not going to write about that in the in the uh, flow chart today. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think I think that's the right way to to limit the scope. And also to keep this sort of uh, within the requirements, it's not a backup app. It, it's not going to save old file versions. So um, it's just going to have the latest version. If you delete that file, there, there's not going to be the way to like restore your backup, anything like that, just to keep us uh, into okay. the current sync. It's just kind of syncing the main files. Um, there's also some non-functional requirements here. Um, so simplicity and trust. Um, so it's the easiest and most trusted platform to use. So with that, simplicity there means to me it's available on any platform. So we've got all these different apps, a mobile app, a web app, a desktop, also high availability. Um, if you need that resume at noon, you've got to be able to access and download it. Um, and it also has to be fast and not a major bandwidth hog. And I think trust uh, means that we can not lose any data. So even though maybe this is a free service, I, I know Dropbox has paid plans, but a lot of them start out as free. Even with free, we want consistent data and high availability of the service. I think that sort of um, makes a bit of sense here. Does that, does that, do you concur? Yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. Sounds good. Perfect. So let's do some back of the napkin math here. Um, so 100 million users signed up and uh, they can have 15 gigs per user. So I'm just going to go into Google here and type in 1 million times uh, 15 gigabytes. So we're looking at 1.5 petabytes of data. So that was 1,000 and 1,500 terabytes. That's quite a bit of data, but not, not unreasonable. Uh, let me say here, data total. Um, and then we've got... Um, 1 million daily active users. So let's divide this out. Uh, we've got a million divided by 24 divided by uh, 3,600 seconds in an hour. So we're looking at about 11 uh, queries per second, requests per second. Uh, QPS, let's say 11. And at, at peak, we might be getting double that. So let's say uh, peak QPS is like 20 per second. That's that's not terrible. Um, and then what else do we have? Ah, we have traffic. So uh, average file is five megabytes and we have a million daily active users. So million uh, times five megabyte. I think we're looking at five terabytes of data. So traffic, five terabytes. Again, it's nothing uh, groundbreaking here. I don't think we have to redesign the internet for this. Um, does this make sense? Is this good so far? Yep, this is good so far. Okay, perfect. When you come into this new, you often, um, you might get stuck in this phase for too long, asking questions about the system, asking about numbers, asking specifics about uh, users, traffic, like you can ask a million questions about data points on an app. But um, in the end, I think there's only three ones that really matter here. Um, One million daily active users, um, and how many they download a day and how big the files are. And so being able to find you might ask 10 pieces of data, but your end design is going to rely on maybe two to three of them. Maybe not always, but um, don't spend too much time in this area. And also um, rely on the interviewer. Like they are there as a sounding board. So you might say, uh, how many users do they have? And they might say 100 million. They might also say, um, I don't know, figure it out. <laughs> like how many do you think they would have? And and you have to be prepared with something like logical at that point. And it and I think either way there, the key is that um, even if they don't give you the answer, the key is to go to the interviewer and ask them uh, and always wrap up with that. Is, is there anything else I've left? Before I move on, is this it? And uh, really give them a chance to guide you.
So I think I'll start jumping into the, the higher level design here and, and, and starting with a higher level concept. Sometimes you might start with a client and a single computer, uh, but we've already identified that there is this need for trust. So we can't be losing, we can't be putting this on a, a USB stick and forgetting where we placed it. It has to be sort of backed up from day one. So I think I'm gonna start with cloud storage in the initial design. Um, also, I'm sure that most of these services like Google Drive probably started its life in a data center. It probably didn't start in a closet at Google. Um, so it kind of makes sense to design this at least um, slightly robust from day one. So let me move um, move around here and to a fresh spot. So we are going to start with uh, a uh, client, I think. So. That makes sense here. Let's do a little box here. All right. Of course, a client is going to be uh, human beings. So we'll put some eyeballs there just to remind us that these are <laughs> people using our app. And so a client, this could be any of the clients. It could be mobile, desktop, web, and it's going to, uh, let me just move this uh, it's over a little bit. Oop. Just to get us some space to draw here. Okay, so the first component I think we're going to add into this is going to be a load balancer to handle all this traffic. Uh, so we're probably getting a, a lot of traffic. And let's just say uh, we've got the lovely orange. Let's just say we're using uh, uh, AWS, the Elastic Load Balancer could really be anything. We could make custom servers at some point. This is really just a block uh, that we're using in here. So we don't really have to worry, not specific about how it works, but it's just a layer in between the application servers, uh, which we're gonna draw in next. Ah, perfect uh, shape here for this. So, so this is gonna handle our application logic. And again, this isn't specific. This could be Amazon EC2 or uh, elastic container services, which allow you to use Kubernetes. So however you've got your app set up, that's this block here. Uh, so yeah, a request is gonna come in. Boop. Uh, it's gonna go from there to get served to one of the application servers. Um, what else do we have? Well, we've already identified we want cloud storage. So let's bring that in uh, now. Maybe I should talk about the APIs a little bit uh, before we get too deep into how this all works. So in this case, let's just say this is S3. Um, yeah, before I draw any connections of how the client interacts with here, I'm gonna define a block with the, uh, the APIs. Okay, so I'm gonna jump down here. I'll try to keep it at that zoom level. And we're gonna draw another section to talk about the APIs. So, We've got a few basic operations in the app here that we figured out uh, at the beginning that we're going to need. So I'll just draw them here uh, or write them out. We've got upload, we've got download, and we have uh, get file revisions. Okay, so we've got these three components. So uploading, this is going to be uh, resumable uploads. So S3 supports uh, resumability uh, uh, with a multi-part multi -part upload. So this is a feature we can use immediately from day one. And so if you have a, a large video, I'm assuming we don't want them to have to um, start over if they close their laptop to move to their couch. Uh, we want it to pick up in the middle and continue uploading. And that's going to sort of add to the, the trust of this app. We don't want um, people to be disappointed with the way it works, the way it uh, fills up their bandwidth cap. So by using S3's feature for multi-part uploads, we can cover that, that uh, feature immediately. So the end point is gonna look something like, uh, let me just unbold this. So it's just a download endpoint like that. And you're gonna request, so when you send data to this endpoint as a client, you're gonna send the data that you wanna upload. So the actual video and then the, uh, the response will be uh, blank. It'll just be a JSON uh, 
200 okay. So you send an upload, if it works, the client uh, says, okay, we've got the upload and they'll be able to manage where they are in the upload download process. Same for downloading. So nothing special, uh, but instead of getting the actual file from the server, uh, that's going to tie up our API servers with sending these long files across the internet. And we really don't want that when we're designing a system of this scale. So rather than um, tie up our API server serving these files, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, the response is going to be a redirect. And uh, so instead of getting the actual uh, data back, you're going to get the location where the data is and the client will go and handle all that um, on their own. Okay, so and that will be so you will send a a request and that will be the file ID. Oh, and I don't have the endpoint. Here we go. Let's do the endpoint. It's gonna be something like got these backwards here, I guess. Uh, so you'll send something to the download endpoint, the file ID, and you'll get back a redirect. Uh, great, so another feature of S3 is you can give a temporary URL that gives access to an object. So you aren't putting their uh, documents publicly on the internet, you're giving this one file temporary access to get it, and that's what the app will prepare. So you wanna request a file, you get a temporary way to get it. If you need it an hour later, you'll have to request again through our servers. And that sort of handles security and uh, not tying up our servers with doing all the, all the work here. Okay, so this endpoint, very similar. I can sense a pattern here. So, and we are going to request the file ID again, and you will uh, uh, get back a list of changes uh, along with a timestamp. And so that'll be enough to say, is this file the latest version or not? And, and do any sort of reconciliation of data. Uh, if you know a client goes offline, goes on vacation for a month and comes back, uh, should be enough data um, with this. Let me just think here for a moment, see if I'm missing anything. Okay, does this make sense so far? So in the high level design, um, you're outlining the main building blocks of the app. And when you start it, you're only gonna have one or two of them. It's not gonna be a complete picture. So I think the important thing to keep in mind is uh, keep building out an entire flow. So keep something in your mind, uh, the path that the human takes is what I always say. You have a client, they come into a load balancer, they hit an API server, then what happens? And use that flow to prompt you on what to build next. And I would go through logically from beginning to end on each of those flows. So I started with upload, um, made that all make sense because that's the first thing you do when you create the app. As a developer, you're gonna launch the app on your computer and you're gonna upload a file in it to test it. And so it's very simple to think like, how would I be building this? What tests would I be doing in my, in my own keyboard to test that this is working? Um, from there, I think you want to have um, a good rationalization for why to use each component. I mean, my example, I said that I chose S3 as the backend storage. And one of the justifications was that it's very commonly used. So uh, people have read blog posts about it. When they join your company, they know what S3 is. They've likely used it in the past uh, position. So this adds a lot of benefit to choosing that, but it also shows the interviewer, uh, you have reasons for picking these tools. It's not just something that you're copying off of a blog post and, uh, and replaying. It's something that you know about and, and you have reasons for using it. Yep, this makes sense so far. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're good to deep dive into the system itself, if you're ready. Okay, back to our simple design here. Sorry about the housekeeping. It doesn't have to be perfect looking, but uh, it does need to line up a little bit and uh, sometimes get a little lost there. So we've got a couple, a couple uh, pieces of detail here, I think. Um, so let's put in here the responsibilities of, uh, of this component here. So there's, there's a couple things that I'm gonna uh, hand off to the client, so to speak. So uh, 
it's going to talk to S3. It's going to do uh, compression, I think. That's a good starting spot. Ah, let's align this left. There we go. And uh, let's say it's going to handle uh, uh, login uh, security to the service. So it's, it's going to log in and, and make sure that you're logged in and it's going to send those login credentials to our API server. So um, this is where the sort of where you type in your password, where you get errors. We're not going to handle any of that from from in our design specifically, but add that here. Mm -hmm. All happens locally. Okay, the responsibilities of the client are going to be interacting with S3, so uh, actually downloading the file, uploading it, and sending uh, credentials and all the security stuff. Um, it's going to be responsible for uh, compression, uh, so making the file smaller, that's going to be the client, and then log into the service. It's going to store the credentials, it's going to uh, send the credentials with requests if required, all that's, we're just going to kind of back that into the client. Why do you want to do the compression on the client instead of on the API server or elsewhere? It's a great question. Um, so I suppose you could put it anywhere. Some logic might say you put it on the API server because you're paying for the CPU there and it's uh, you're not causing the, the client to bear the brunt of compression. However, um, when you do the compression on the client side, um, then that file, when it goes through cloud storage, when it gets sent over the internet, it is already compressed. And so um, it's sort of a trade-off. You want to balance uh, being nice to the client and them using their, their, their CPU to compress the file, or do we want to waste their bandwidth? And I think in this situation, the CPU cost to compress a file is going to be minor uh, compared to somebody uh, using up all their uh, bandwidth on their internet connection. That would, I think, be worse. Um, nobody's going to notice that their CPU ran for an extra half second. So we're going to put that in the client. And it also allows um, you to handle stuff differently. Maybe it's uh, maybe you don't want to do that on the phone because of battery life, or maybe you do want to do it more heavily on the phone because of battery life. This lets you uh, put the compression right where the problem is. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Next, I think I want to walk through um, the schema of this uh, database. So, figuring out where where we're gonna what what sort of data pieces we're gonna need to be able to pull all this together. Um, obviously, we have a client with logins. We have uh, files up in cloud storage. Uh, before we connect all this together, um, let's just sort of um, uh, formulate the structure of the, the tables of what we're going to look like. So let me move to a new spot on this uh, Figma. And maybe right in here should be perfect. Let's do another color here. Um, Light blue is lovely. Okay, so schema. Easier said than typed. <laughs> All right, so uh, we've obviously got, um, you know, we've got uh, clients here. So number one, the eyeballs, uh, that's easy to start with because 100% is going to be sort of our main. Uh, we start with the user. We start with the humans that are that are going into this. So let's um, let's bring this out here. Let me make this a little bit bigger as well because I think we're probably going to have a few more tables. Okay. Let's say uh, user, and the user is going to have a, an ID, which is going to be big int. Um, we don't want to use just integer. You'll have the YouTube problem. I don't know if you've heard about that one, but uh, when YouTube got its two millionth uh, video or two billionth video, uh, they were using integer and it uh, crashed their database. So we're going to use big int and avoid the, the YouTube problem. Um, we're going to use string. Uh, this is sort of a Rails term, but uh, var char as well as similar. I'm going to call it string uh, just for simplicity. Uh, you're going to need an email. Uh, obviously, this is going to be a string and a a password hash, a string. Um, we might want to store that last login uh, or last uh, sign in, which will be uh, a date stamp, a timestamp. Uh, so this has a file. So that's what the person is going to do. I sort of like working with the, the process of 
of actually simulating in the app. So uh, a user exists first, they're the person that signs in and, and sign in causes you to need a, you know, a username and email a password. Uh, next up, we've got uh, file, uh, which is again gonna have an ID. Uh, we are gonna have a uh, path, which will be um, and string or varchar. It's a little bit bigger, there we go. Uh, and I'm gonna align this left, there we go, beautiful. We might want something like a, a file hash, so you're able to know the contents of the file, and that would be a representation of um, what sort of files are, are being uploaded. All right, I seem to have got underlined, there we go. And uh, an owner ID should be a big int, and that, and that, will, that will relate back to the user. Okay, so now I've already identified we're gonna need uh, file version, latest version. So let's do that one next, because uh, each file might have different versions. All right. Again, an ID. Surprise, surprise, and then a file ID to refer to the file we're talking about. And then a, a version number. Which maybe doesn't have to be big int, but we will uh, keep it that way, assuming our app can grow infinitely large and successful for many years. Um, so within this, I wonder if I'm missing anything. Just trying to think here um, what a system like this needs. Um, and I think I'm going to need to expand this already a bit. Perfect, OK. Because I'm going to want to draw lines between these in a moment. I think it'll get messy. Uh, um, OK, you know what? I'm going to add this little thing here. Um, uh, Rails automatically does timestamps created at, updated at. So uh, I'm just going to, uh, I'm familiar with Rails, so I'm not going to write it in. But we're just going to write it here. All of them have this uh, field here. So we'll be able to see when the file was updated. We don't have to add a special field for that. Um, this is sort of the shorthand that I'm using in my hand. But so that we all understand it, I'll explicitly write it out here uh, because not all frameworks uh, have that convenience. So I think the one thing we're missing here is a devices table. Um, I'm just trying to think, is this necessary? I think it is. I'll sort of explain my thinking here. So you have a user logged in, uh, but the user is logged in on their phone and their desktop. And so the, the app needs a way to know um, which of those users is signing in and requesting a file. Because when a file version changes, um, one of the devices will be out of sync, the one that didn't initiate the change. And so I think this devices table is going to give us a spot to, to place that data. Uh, and also be able to, to act on it. So it'll have a user ID, user oh, UD, user ID. OK, so let me connect these all up. Hopefully the lines are working in my favor today. Here we go. So this will be a file ID. So the, the file ID will relate back to a file. OK, and so I think that the devices is going to link back to a uh, user. And this is going to be uh, on the uh, user, user ID. OK. And of course, a user is going to own a file. OK. So this will. OK. Right. So a, a user here has a file. A file has a version. Uh, users can be on different devices. Um, OK, so far, so good. I think this is a general. Uh, we can sort of just put this over to the side for now. This is a general schema uh, that should cover our, uh, our designs here. OK, so that's the schema. That, that is the spot where the, the app is going to store data. But the, the actual, uh, let's say, upload flow, I'll work through that as I draw through the, the lines on here, because I think um, it kind of helps to follow a logical flow. When you uh, upload a file, let me just 
move this around here. Okay, so when you upload a file, uh, you're going to be doing a, uh, let's get orange colors for this line. Uh, you're going to be going from the client, oh, there we go. So this is, this is the actual data transfer that's happening. Um, and so this is actually bidirectional. So I'll put the arrow on the other side as well. Um, so the client is going to send data directly to S3. And when the client needs data, it's going to go directly to S3. And that was that component I talked about, not blocking our API servers with these long flowing data. The, the download might take two, three minutes, um, but requesting a login, requesting with the, and interacting with the API, that's going to happen in uh, seconds, milliseconds, hopefully. Um, so the next component we have is the uh, database. Uh, so let's give this a little different color here. So this is going to be the uh, metadata database. And uh, what is this going to be? How is this going to be built? I'm going to choose uh, uh, RDS, Amazon RDS, Relational Data Store. Um, and something like MySQL or Postgres probably. So I'll just, MySQL, I'll just put that in there. And that talks about the, um, the durability of the data. We want to be able to get something consistently. Um, so something like uh, a NoSQL database, it can perhaps do that, but by default, it doesn't give that guarantee. With the CAP theorem, uh, consistency, availability, or partition tolerance, uh, you're going to have to choose uh, to, to kind of prefer one or the other. So we want the data to be very consistent, and so that's why I'm going to choose MySQL. The other reason I'm going to choose MySQL is uh, uh, it's a kind of a, a simpler problem. It's just there's a lot of people who are knowledgeable about it. It doesn't take any extra developer uh, onboarding to get, get using that. Same with S3. The reason to use S3 is it's something in most engineers' toolkits. So um, when you hire a new engineer, you're not going to have to train them on MySQL. Chances are they're going to be uh, halfway to an expert on that system already. Um, so the other thing missing here is the notification service. So let's put that up in this blank area here. So um, so this is going to be something like uh, SNS or any um, pub sub service. And this lets uh, clients subscribe for notifications, and it lets application servers send notifications to that channel. So um, when there's a new file, uploaded, you're going to, the, the API server is going to send that information to the notification service. Uh, and then that is going to, again, feed back into clients. Let's get these lines angled nicely. There we go. Wonderful. So that is the upload flow, roughly. I'll just walk through it again. The client logs in, hits a load balancer. They get an API server. The API server says, great. Uh, you want to upload a file. Um, and they're going to prepare a pre-signed URL for cloud storage up here, this component. So uh, we, we go from client, load balancer, API server, back to client, and they get a, a destination to send their file. Client uploads that to S3. And when they're done, they're going to talk to the API server and say, thumbs up. That's all up there. And then the uh, metadata database will now have that file record as a confirmed record in its database. And so if we uh, were to imagine another set of clients here. Uh, I'm not going to duplicate it because of all the artwork will be lost. But once we get a second set of clients, they're going to be able to uh, pick up the changes just the same uh, based on this data. And uh, then they'll be able to do the download flow. So let's say this is a second client. Client number one's just put some stuff up here. Um, what's going to kick off is something in the notification service. Notification service will then uh, call your client, knock on its door, say, hello, uh, you have a new file waiting for you in S3. The client will then go to the API server. API server will fetch that download link that we talked about in the uh, in the API design. And it's going to use that URL to download the file from cloud storage. So uh, yeah, it's going to hit this download endpoint. And then now the client will have, client two will have what client one had. And the uh, flow is uh, completed here. So I think that makes pretty much sense here. Just be aware of the time. Uh, it can help to set some uh, some timers maybe 15 minutes in to make sure that you know that that pivotal moment to switch into the, the deep dive. Um, because sometimes the, interview will, the interviewer will not prompt you 
immediately as soon as you would want to jump in. And I think you want to spend the most, the majority of your time in that design of the system to be able to uh, display the, the best of your knowledge to the interviewer. It's also okay to describe the parts which you don't know and you are not an expert on. So for example, I may have never used S3 and in my mind, it is just a black box you put files in and I don't know about a lot of its features. That's fine to, to mention that, but don't uh, sound like an expert and just put S3 up there. Mention that we're gonna use S3, but I'm actually, I've never used it. The way I understand it is it is X and you state the parts that you do understand and it shows that you're not uh, overconfident about your, your skills. And it also shows which areas you're able to get uh, a deeper dive in. They're not gonna ask you to go into details about how clients will upload to S3. If you've stated that you're more of a CDN server expert, and uh, I think that helps you guide the interview uh, to where you want it to go better. Okay, so I think uh, what I've discussed here, we've got the upload flow, we've got the download flow, we have the notification service and how that uh, hooks into all of these systems. Um, does that sort of make sense for the, the, the design here of the system? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think we're getting kind of starting to get near to the end of the interview. So maybe you want to kind of make some refinements to your design um, in the remaining time. Before we run out of time and I uh, can't uh, improve it further, let's kind of give a few of the ideas I have about making the system a little bit better. Um, there's some stuff that I haven't fully drawn here. So one of them is, um, is uh, regionality. So this system might be considered to be in its own, in its own box. Um, so uh, there is sort of like a major um, system here. Uh, this looks awful, but we assume that this whole system is a self-contained box and can be, can be replicated in other regions. So this might be the North American uh, incarnation of our uh, file sharing service. However, uh, suddenly you get very popular in the Eurozone and you want a server that's based in Europe, you might replicate um, this entire component aside from the cloud storage and move it regionally. And that'll, um, the load balancer will then route traffic locally. It'll be much faster for people. Um, then you also get the benefit of, uh, you know, the, the nitty gritty of running a server. You might have to shut it down for maintenance. Uh, what happens when North America goes down? Well, uh, you can now flip over to your European zone, which will have an exact uh, view perspective of what's uh, to be delivered in North America. And then your clients might get a slightly slower response for that afternoon, but it won't go down, which will kind of enhance the trust uh, of the service. Something we didn't talk about is how we store files in S3. So the, the S3 is like a bucket and uh, we might have uh, user one uh, file, uh, user two file. Um, we may put everything at the root level of the directory, like the very top level. And that may seem sort of naively not a problem. However, um, many successful cloud services that rely on S3 have run into this problem. Um, it's maybe not obvious. Um, S3 is not magical. It is limited to a certain number of files, a certain number of sizes, but the guarantee, and if you read the docs carefully, is that Amazon will partition this in the background and make it more available. So if you suddenly have a bunch of data in user one, let's say this is too big, um, what it'll do is it'll actually split up this uh, user one folder into separate folders. I'm just kind of drawing slashes here to um, indicate that. And that by, by adding folders, it allows S3 to be fast and do all its magic. However, uh, your application might get errors at that time while it's doing that. And so uh, to get ahead of that process, I would uh, recommend in this design to write something like um, uh, like app and then uh, uh, just for example, just some random data ahead of the user. So. Uh, let me get rid of this junk so it all shows up on one line, uh, if I can. So your actual um, user will be padded with all this data at the beginning. And, and that extra string at the beginning is enough to kind of buy you a little bit more uh, time from S3 before it crashes. Um, there's one more uh, component here that we didn't draw. And I think most production systems will have this in. I think everyone uses uh, Amazon S3 with a, uh, a CDN. So the way that that would actually work uh, to redraw this a little bit uh, with the CDN concept in mind is um, 
the client interacts with the CDN. If the CDN has it, it sends the data. If the CDN doesn't, it gets it from storage. And now the CDN has it uh, for future users. And that's just another system to uh, save costs and also make things faster, more regionally aware. So again, that uh, European North America, if you didn't have two data centers, a CDN would be another way to achieve that speed for, um, for local users. Um, out of scope and something we specifically didn't cover, uh, but I'll mention it because we're using S3 was backups or, or versions. Um, and so I can see kind of it being really attractive to offer, a Dropbox has a paid plan. So perhaps they would wanna offer versioning. And I only bring it up because you can actually do this for free with S3. So by picking Amazon as a provider for this, you can just click a switch and have backups available for customers. Obviously, we bear the brunt on storing all those uh, files. We pay for that. Um, but even if we wanted to provide like version from one month ago, this could be a way that we could just instantly uh, provide this functionality sort of for free without a lot of the engineering cost. Um, what other improvements might I think of here? Um, we didn't talk about it, but uh, we might also add to a responsibilities encryption. And why would we do encryption and why would we do it on the client? Um, Data breaches. Sometimes S3 gets uh, gets uh, broken into, or 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 one of your your laptops gets stolen, and so there is a real danger of somebody accessing that and seeing somebody's private information. Now, if you encrypt it on the client side, that risk is kind of eliminated. So I think uh, most services of this caliber, um, any company with a legal team, is probably going to implement this feature. Um, again, I didn't talk about it uh, because it's client side. We can always add more features into the client, but it doesn't really affect the system uh, in its overall uh, architecture. Uh, finally, the one thing I didn't go into detail with was the database setup. So uh, this is one block here, but realistically, you're probably going to have uh, at least three more. Um, one is going to be a uh, slave, which is just copying everything. Um, and a few others will be read replicas, which will also be available to provide. And so um, if this main server, um, if this main server goes down, I don't know how to draw this, just a big giant triangle, um, then the, the application server will be able to go to its backup and instantly serve customers. So this is sort of, um, this comes out of the box with RDS often, like you have the ability to set that up, but I did not mention it in the design. So I think, um, that would be worth mentioning. And also if you had different regions, the thing I initially talked about, uh, you'll definitely need uh, databases in those regions. So um, yeah, multiple databases, I think another consideration uh, or improvement for this uh, system. And, and do we consider read traffic to be the same level as write traffic? And how does this system handle that? Oh, interesting, yeah. Well, that's a really, really good point. So this system might actually have, um, how do we draw this? Let's say, uh, others uh, that are uh, that are uh, many. So we've got a lot of others and they're all actually uh, uh, contacting the system as well and they need uh, access. Okay, so what we might do then is have a uh, separate system for them to go to. So to just quickly re-architect this entire thing, uh, the API server and your logged in clients uh, do writing to this database. However, um, when they need to read, uh, they will read from another set of databases. And likewise, when clients need to read, because the clients, let's say uh, you share the link on a forum, 100 clients are coming to download it, uh, many more, you'll actually have um, a separate metadata service to handle that. And it'll have its own copy of metadata that uh, won't interfere. And also you'll have the CDN uh, to handle that traffic. So we sort of covered uh, high read with the CDN at the last minute, but not the database side of it. So yeah, I think a second... Um, master slave here for reading okay. would be appropriate. Um, and yeah, one other question. Does this design account for folders? Ooh, really good question. Let me think about this for a moment. So, um, ah, that's a good point. So let me jump over to our schema and add in a little piece of detail about that. So, uh, path, here's what I... I was trying to be as quick as possible. And so the path would look something, uh, let's just go down here. It'll be um, uh, me slash uh, doc slash uh, text.txt. Now, uh, what if I had a file, uh, I guess you're saying, uh, called uh, me slash docs? How do I know that that's a file or how do I know that that's a folder? 
Um, I suppose obviously you could do what I just did there and have this um, backslash and interpret it, but let's just say, let's add a field here, uh, is folder and make that Boolean. So there can be a representation of a file. Uh, and when you click that file in the app, uh, you get to a page that is empty because it is actually a folder. Um, uh, interesting bit of nuance there that I didn't capture. Once you've got a system like this designed um, and you're asked to provide some improvements, how could you handle scaling? How could you handle this and that? Um, the concept of a data center comes to mind instantly uh, because you can simply wrap a box around what you've already drawn or most of the components of what you've drawn and just say that we will uh, add this feature by duplicating it. We now have uh, Europe and we have an Asian data center. And uh, by saying that, it adds a little bit of um, meta knowledge. You understand that these components can be separated. So for example, S3 is global, your CDN is global. However, your API servers, load balancer are regional. Your clients are also regional. and so. Putting these boxes um, and saying that you can scale your system regionally is a really easy way to uh, kind of level up the design and, and improve it without having to complicate the, uh, the actual flowchart that you've just designed. I think another thing to mention at this stage are things that you haven't covered. Um, so you may have in mind um, a specific technique that you haven't done or a specific feature that your app doesn't have. Um, the example I used was backups or versions. We didn't want it, but it's conceivable that one day somebody might ask about it. You may want a premium level of your app. And so these are the sorts of questions that interviewers will, will throw at you. I know we didn't design it with backups, but how would we implement that now? Um, and so for you to jump in and show your knowledge of S3, ah, it has versioning. It ha supports that out of the box. Um, it, showed, it shows that you understand how the components work, how they can be modified, how you can refactor this design uh, to actually work in production. One more thing that was not talked about, this is a file uh, system. And uh, sort of the nitty gritty of working with these file systems is you may have conflicts. And let's say you and I are both on two different computers, uh, the same user account, I guess, based on our simplistic design. And we both upload a very important document with the same name at the same time. Uh, we both spend an hour composing it and it both hits the server. What do we do? Do we delete one of them or the other? I think the system uh, to ensure trust needs to consider conflict resolution. Um, usually these sorts of apps will just put like a duplicate file with a timestamp. If it can't figure out what's going on, um, it's not gonna delete the file. It's gonna still sync those two versions to two computers, but uh, conflict resolution is kind of important here because you don't want anything to drop on the floor. You wanna handle all your customers' requests. Okay, yeah, I think, um, I think that brings us to the end of the interview. Alex, um, thanks for a really, Really good design there. Um, how was how was the experience for you being in the hot seat? It was great. It was a uh, it was a little nerve wracking at times. I think um, one of the big pieces of advice is um, just getting used to the keyboard shortcuts and uh, getting used to manipulating everything. But no, it was a lot of fun and, and kind of interesting to see things from the other side of the uh, camera. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for doing it. And um, yeah, we'd love to have you back on uh, another time. So yeah, thank you and uh, yeah, cheers. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Hello, really hope you found that useful. If you did, you can like and subscribe and why not come visit us at igotanoffer.com. There you can find more videos, useful frameworks and question guides all completely free. And you can also book expert feedback one-to-one -one with our coaches from Google, Meta, Amazon, etc. Thank you and good luck with your interview.